Welcome to Balanced Life with Debbie Carlin Boyle, conversations connecting to a healthier you, the show that gives you all the latest and greatest health and wellness information to inspire you to live a life of balance and joy. Debbie Carlin Boyle is a health and nutrition coach, personal trainer, and fitness instructor who helps her clients live in balance with everything that feeds us in addition to the food on our plate. Please welcome your host, Debbie Carlin Boyle. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome. It's a beautiful summer day here in sunny downtown Burbank, California. And I welcome you to my show. It is Balanced Life with me, Debbie Carlin Boyle, where conversations that connect to a healthier you. And we want you to get involved with the show today. So because I like to have everybody be interactive. So to do that, you can call in. And the number here is 323-843-2826. So anytime during the show, if you feel compelled to ask a question or make a comment of me or my guest, please do so. If you'd rather go to my Facebook page, which is Fit by Design, also known as Balanced Life by Debbie, it is streaming, our show is streaming live there right now, and you can make a comment, and myself or my guest will get back to you. So... All that being said, I have a great guest for you today, and Dr. Stephen Poulter is a renowned licensed clinical psychiatrist in practice, psychologist in uh, private practice here in West Los Angeles, California. He has been providing professional mental health services to clients for well over 35 years. Dr. Poulter is a public speaker on parenting, adolescent and spiritual psychological issues, and he is also the author of seven books, which include Your X Factor, The Mother Factor, Father Your Son, The Father Factor, The Art of Successful Failure, and his latest release, The Shame Factor. Today, we will learn how to heal your deepest fears and set yourself free of the emotional boundaries known as shame. Will you please welcome back to my show, my amazing guest and my friend, Dr. Stephen Poulter. Thank you, Debbie. Hi, Stephen. It's great to be here again. Otherwise known as Dr. P in the world of us who are your clients or patients, which in full transparency, I can tell you that I am. <laughs> so, and he's helped me through some really tough times. Uh, through, And I found you initially through your book, Your X Factor. Correct. And... Um, it was very enlightening to me. I looked at the back and said, oh, Brentwood, California. I live in California. I live close to Brentwood. I'm calling that man. And I did. And you helped me immensely to stay in my lane, as you would say, during a very difficult time in my life. And um, I can't have mm-hmm. enough gratitude or tell you how much I appreciate that. So subsequently, moving forward, um, Del and I started a show, Del and Debbie's Mind, Body, Soul. Mm -hmm. And in full disclosure, you've been on our show five times. Because every time you had a book, (laughs) we had you on. Well, you had some books that were already out. Um, The um, Father, Your Son was the one. Well, we kind of talked about that with your the Father father Factor. factor. Correct. But um, this is your sixth appearance with me. Yes, and it's I um, I appreciate this immensely. This book, the shame your shame factor, the shame mm-hmm. factor. Um, you did a little a talk on recently here locally in L.A. at the Mystic Bookstore, and I was able to attend that. And you went through chapters very, um, subs- uh, you know, very uh, eloquently, I should say, to help the audience understand mm-hmm. what role shame plays in our life and we're going to get to that but before we do (laughs) i want to talk about you a little bit for those who haven't had the opportunity to learn a little bit about your background and know you know how you sit in this seat today and how you've written all these books that you've written so Tell us a little bit about it. That's, that's okay. I, I assume it's all that good. The, every time new audiences, I'm going to have to, I, I want them Absolutely. to know a little bit about you. You know, it's interesting. Right here, I wrote seven books, and I say in the introduction in the book that I grew up thinking I wasn't, I wasn't smart. Hmm. I had a reading problem first grade through sixth grade, and it was torture. I, it just not popular then. And 
by the time I got to about the seventh grade, my mom, as I said, got me a subscription to Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. I read it cover to cover. I knew it. And it, uh, one day I could read. Yeah. And I find the writing just evolving over the years. It's about getting information out there. Mm -hmm. Because these issues are seminal, meaning our relationship with our dad, our mother, how to overcome hard with it to a greater or lesser degree. And it comes out in many different ways, such as I don't feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I can't do that. I'm afraid right. they're going to reject me. You allow me. people to yep. objectify you and, 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 and uh, criticize you, and mm -hmm. you believe it, you take it. You sit back and observe and don't, you know, which we're going to get into all the Correct. different types, uh, the seven different types of, where you were a yes, police I was. officer for a while. And, and it was a great education. Yeah. It grew me up. Yeah. And I look back on those days. It was difficult. I felt like I was pushing a boat on the sand. <laughs> I love your the, analogies. <laughs> yeah, it, was, the best. it was a long beach to yeah. get to the water. But it was a, it was a, a very interesting time because a lot of this stuff got planted. I'd see fatherless boys, I'd see domestic violence, I'd see what happens when people, when men don't manage their rage, mm -hmm. anger becomes toxic, and when women don't, how it becomes toxic to them. All these things were happening between the ages of two. You can see. So making that imprint on you, did you ever think from, that you would be studying psychology and um, trying to get behind what's going on, trying to get to the to the beginnings of why this is going on you know, and helping people that way? As I say to my clients, getting through the decade of your 20s, I always wanted to work with people. I, didn't, I wasn't really interested in finance because I, okay, I can make a lot of money, but I was interested in doing something different, more humanitarian, mm -hmm. and I believe in this life that was my passion. I first thought about being a forest ranger, Mm -hmm. And this was back in the late 70s when they weren't hiring forest rangers. So kind of threw that idea out. And when I was graduating from college, this guy came on campus. This police captain was like a Tom Berenger July 4th movie with um, Tom Cruise. And he says, you guys will make a difference in the city? Join the police department. Do so something different. Resonate. I'm like, let's do it. Yeah. And once I started doing I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? This is way beyond me. Yeah. It took me two years to catch up to that game. Like they talk about it. It took me two years before I felt like I could catch up to the speed of the job. And feel like that this was, uh, but, but you always had that feeling that I could do better helping people than getting here after the fact. I would Because it's already escalated by the time you're you would say, there. You, better, it's interesting, because I used to think after we left, what are these people going to do? Yeah. Who's going to help them? Right. Change. Like, okay, so we clean up the murder scene, they wash it down the street, but who's gonna deal with the emotional wreckage? Yeah. That was always a thought. Interesting. I used to think, so after we leave, and the fire department leaves, and the paramedics take the person away. Who really picks up the pieces? The that emotional always pieces. always intrigued me. Positive, if you can. Uh, proactive. Yeah, proactive yeah, Proactive, yeah. in front of the, of mm -hmm. the wave. Yeah. And so I really, in, I always thought it was interesting. The first day on the job, I think I've told you, it's working swing shift three to 11, and we get a call, 911, shots fired, uh, um, husband and wife fight. Turned out to be a boyfriend, girlfriend. Her boyfriend came home from work and was in a bad mood again. And this, sure. my partner looked at me and goes, uh, welcome to the NFL. And Whoa. I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah, and I remember that's your thinking, initiation. Yeah, I remember thinking, what is she gonna do with this? I, I used to think that all the time. And my um, partners would say, what are you thinking? Like, How is she gonna handle it? Yeah, the rest of her life. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like. What do you do with this? How do you come home realizing there was a murder in your living room? Right. But that's that you're responsible it, it, for. Right. Right. Or you're a part of your story. Okay. Because now it all falls into place. Why you've written these seven books and what you've seen in your practice and what you know and what you've studied and what you've learned through your because m most of your books have your patient stories in there, your client stories, and, and they're composite of people. Right. The I, themes are universal. Right. It's, situations and common themes and i find shame people come to therapy and they want to feel better right it doesn't matter what my degree or titles after my name is do people feel better and i found like 30 years ago the whole idea about shame How really to, plays a big part it's sort of a huge umbrella over us so let's start with that what is shame what is shame 
I always start off with what shame isn't. Okay. It's not guilt. Okay. So what's the difference between guilt and guilt shame? Guilt is an action. Okay. Like, you know, I, I cut off somebody on the road or I got out of something or I didn't pay for something. Guilt is always related to an action. Right. Shame is a feeling. It's intrinsic inside of you. That you can't just You can't wash away. it off. Right, yeah. you can't. Good works may uh, assuage it for a while, but ultimately it's a deep sense of feeling inadequate. And that comes building up over a period of time. That's oh, yes. not, like guilt is more about the in- situational. It's situational and very almost impulsive. Right, Yeah. where guilt is, yeah, I should have tipped that person more. I feel bad I yelled at somebody. That's guilt. Right. There's, it's a definite A plus B equals C. Right. Actions, boundaries, consequences. Right. In the moment. Right. Where shame is much more insidious, much more ne- – it's like up. jello. It's inside of you. It's, it's hard to get. And people tend to build their life around it. Yeah. To keep it away. So they ignore right. what – thus the shame factor. Sure. But – Shame comes in so many different forms because we're all raised different ways and we all absorb how our shame is going to play out differently based on what our childhood is and what our perception of how we're being treated is, like you were saying earlier about yourself. Right. So um, so, so, tell us, what are the... Uh, what shame is, essentially, is this pervasive sense of not feeling good enough and I use different words, it's never enough, feeling like damaged goods, it's your fault, it's my responsibility, and there's a deep sense of feeling defective. Mm-hmm. Now, it can translate into anxiety or depression mm-hmm. or all these other psychological symptoms, but I believe shame in and of itself is its own diagnosis. Right, and uh, and we're gonna get into, to that more. yeah, the, the way, it does play manifest out. and play out and how we can treat it mm-hmm. to get out of that cycle, cycle of shame. Because you have, um, you talk about the uh, seven common emotional triggers, triggers of shame. A lot of people I think, oh, I don't really have any shame, but they have a horrendous fear of embarrassment or fear of being seen. Right, that, I was gonna ask you that because um, embarrassment is always something again that's more situational i would say you know like oh my god you know uh my uh pants just tore in the crotch or something and now you're embarrassed so this this is a little different yeah okay this is much more about you want to hide from life Mm -hmm. you don't want to be seen right like i have a lot of women grand scale right i have women in my practice right now they want to elope because they don't want to be the center of attention at their wedding Oh, I they get don't want that. to be seen. I've known people like that. Yeah, right, they don't want to be seen. Yeah, and because deep down, so are they both? They both have shame in their lives, right? Separately, separately that have and come together, com- <laughs> and it comes out as a fear of being seen. It's a, like an emotional paralysis of being seen, or people are going to notice you. And it's many times it's like I want to hide from life. I want to stay in the background because I don't want to feel this uncomfortableness I have right. about myself. And that goes back to the age-old overcoming our fears, our fears of uh, what people might think, right? Or how judgment, or how am I going to be perceived? See, and, and that gets into intimacy because that what you just touched on is codependence. Because mm-hmm. your opinion of me is more important than mine. Absolutely, what? most people operate that way, correct? Well, but they shouldn't. Correct. Yes. that's why people talk about the divorce rates high. The divorce rates not high. The shame rates high. Yes. And if shame is high in your life, intimacy and shame don't mix. Never blend. They're not going oil and water. They repel yeah. each other. Oil and vinegar. They don't mix. Right. And we're going to get into how they don't no, mix. mix because you have a whole chapter on that. Yes, I yeah. do. <laughs> so and and so so the feeling of anger and powerlessness that See, you have. And, with... shame, and anger is a secondary emotion. The primary emotion is shame. Is I feel invisible or I feel defective. Mm-hmm. And it, men. It comes out with men, they tend to externalize it on the world. Like Stephen Paddock. Oh, right. There, go and shoot people. Right, and, Mandalay Bay, yeah. mm-hmm. where, I mean, by the grace of God, his gun melted. Yes. And Otherwise, have been, you know, who knows, maybe thousands of people. Right, killed. right. And you know it's shame because shame is always self hatred at the end of the day. Shame leads to self hatred. Okay. That's the dead end street. 
It and goes, takes you down. And he, he commits suicide. Right. There was 58 deaths and 59, he was the last one. So, and why, uh, so, me, okay, I'm yeah. thought about women. Yeah, okay. Women turn it into inwards. Yeah, and more of an emotional, and they get destructive too. Correct. With medicating or, or body dysmorphia. Body dysmorphia, eating, eating disorders. Yep. yep. Women internalize it, men externalize it. Neither's good. No. Neither's good. Neither's not dealing <laughs> no, with no. the uh, shame yeah, that has been building kind of, up right. their entire lives. And after a while, people think, well, this is just who I am. I'm like, uh, no, 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 it's not. And that leads into the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. where the Wall Street Journal did a big article about that in business. How, on Wall Street, how many people are afraid they're going to be seen as being inadequate or not competent? It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that it's not their job. It's who they feel about themselves. Right. And it comes out in their job. Mm -hmm. That's the imposter syndrome. Yeah, where they're playing a part almost. Yep. 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 And they, you know, it's like a glass ceiling. Many people feel like, I have this glass ceiling in my life. It's the shame ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a glass wall between you and the next step. Right. And you can't move forward because you're almost paralyzed right. of, from the shame that you're like manifesting. And, and you're going to be exposed. And, yes. And God forbid. Right. And yeah. exposure and shame, it, they're like we talk about the emotional terrorist inside of us. Like the hunter. I love that. I love that phrase. Emotional terrorist. About, yeah. Because he's hunting us or she's hunting you. Yeah. Mine's hunting me. We're our own worst enemy. Right. And that's where that term comes from. You know, because the imposter syndrome is I'm fooling everybody that I'm good enough. No, you're not. You are competent. Right. Now, that, now, perfection is a form of shame. Trying to be perfect is a form of shame. Making mistakes and learning. Fear of failure or, right. fail, uh, again, fear mm -hmm. of judgment that you're not good enough at something, so you're going to work really hard to Correct. be perfect, which there's no such thing. No such thing. Yeah. But that breeds shame. Mm -hmm. And the imposter syndrome, boom, it's up. Yeah. It's like you have to wear a costume when you go to work. Yeah, makes sense. Emotionally. Yeah. The other one is, and it's interesting, is isolation. People tend to isolate because mm -hmm. they don't, they can't tolerate the feelings of ever thinking they're not good enough. Right. So they much rather stay on the periphery of life, not be in relationships, the work. Oh, we have a phone call. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but like, you, yeah, you can look at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're not going to pop up. Oh, hey, how are you? It's okay. <laughs> yeah, we always like phone calls. Hi, caller. Are you there? Hello? Hello? Hi. What's your name and where are you Hi. calling from? Okay. Uh, my first name is Sona and I'm calling from Montreal. Oh, hi, Sonia. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Are you listening to the show with Dr. Stephen Poulter? Well, actually, uh, I just dialed and I wasn't sure. I was like, you know, um, can you please remind me of the topic? Yes. So we're talking about his book, his new book called The Shame Factor. And we're talking about how shame enters your life and what form it takes and how to deal with it. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't think I was following, but uh, definitely it's a topic that uh, I can uh, share my part of uh, shame. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do. The way I, definite, definitely, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm 54 years old, and uh, I come from a culture where um, uh, if you don't respect certain rules, you are, uh, you are considered as, uh, they will actually outcast you even if you don't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you one example. Uh, we um, uh, we mm -hmm. I'm born and raised in Lebanon, and then we moved to Canada I, when mm -hmm. I was 21. So and uh, so I decided to leave uh, home when I was 22 and mm -hmm. live by myself. So as my parents, uh, they come from a culture where this is seen as. Uh, bad uh, especially when they go to the church people will talk about it that the daughter left the house so and yeah. uh, they come from uh, um, not very good proper um, parenting mm -hmm. uh, they are not the parents that are uh, equipped well to uh, to um, educate their or em to be there emotionally to their children my parents so what they did, they decided to uh, uh, not to talk to me for so many years. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And uh, it because they were kind of ashamed of it. Uh, this is not the right, the proper way of feeling shame. So personally, myself, for so many years, I was hiding. I wasn't going to mm. all these cultural places. Mm -hmm. Just talking about seen. this. Right. This is you, yeah, you, afraid of afraid of being seen fra, uh, by people who contact my parents, and they will uh, finger uh, like you know they will uh, kind of give me dirty looks, and I was ashamed of that. Yes, and wow. that affected my my entire life, and uh, it added to my health and. Uh, Big time, know. I understand right. that. So, Doctor Poulter is going to address that right now. Well, it was funny you said it very well that the shame about feeling culturally that you're there's something wrong with you, even though what you did in many cultures is considered mental health, and that's yes. where and that's the the tricky part of shame is how do you be your how can you be how your do you own, survive right, right? How, your true self yes. in, in a situation like that, and ultimately you have to do what's inside of your heart because you know it takes a lot of courage to do that. To leave home and be independent because yes. if, if you didn't do that you would have probably become very very unhappy you know and all the issues depressed right and all the issues that go with that so that's a very courageous move to separate from the family we call that separation and indivi individuation process and many people never do it you know they talk about failure to launch guys that stay home forever daughters that never leave their mom mm -hmm. or their father is because of this issue that if you leave the family you're bad Right. And that's where shame comes yeah. in. Because you're not bad. It's and, part of your natural and, and, process. Yes. And uh, I find that for the word shame, for each culture, it means something different. You know, it's interesting. I think it plays out differently. But I think the, the bottom line, the, you know, the numerator universal. is universal, is different. But underneath, Sonia, the, the feeling is common. The fact that you don't feel good enough about yourself and you're doing something wrong. That unfortunately is yeah. very universal. Sonia, has it? Ha, have you been able? Because you recognize it very well. You were very um, yeah. articulate about how what it was and, and identifying shame in your life. How yeah. and, and saying that it did take you know an emotional and physical toll on you. How have you dealt with it? I'm curious. What what steps have you taken to know that this is not something that you should absorb this deeply? And what have you done to help yourself? I, I, I could say uh, both fortunately and unfortunately. The fortunately is because some people, they will never realize what's happening and they will suffer their entire life. In my, in my case, I would say uh, uh, the shame was not the only issue. Is Again, uh, we had the narcissistic parents and the dynamic was very... Uh, an unhealthy dynamic mm -hmm. and that's what, one of the reasons I decided to leave the house man, you know and uh, uh, what I did I kept myself so busy because I was the scapegoat so I, I was I, I had two jobs and uh, went uh, to university at night uh, so for 10-15 years I didn't have time to think about it at one point I kind of uh, couldn't take it anymore and uh, I got literally sick. Then I had time in my hands, uh, like, you know, I was at home, I was on sick leave. Mm -hmm. Then I had time in my hand to Address. think about it and realize what right. was happening really uh, inside of me and it, that it wasn't my, my fault. And uh, I did a lot of work. I could say for 10 years I've mm -hmm. been reading books and uh, trying to get all kinds of help to realize what was happening. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. That is excellent. And you're helping a lot of people by calling in today because it says yeah. there Very is well, help though. out there because this is a big uh, this, this is a big story that you have because that shame mm -hmm. has followed you this far and that you actually recognized it and got help for it. Any suggestions for Sonia at this point? I think she, Sonia, I think it's great that, that you took time. Yes. It, it's interesting that shame always has a way of you can push it down and be as busy as possible but it never the hunter is always hunting you and one day it catches yes. up and then you have to, to reconcile with it mm -hmm. and people go what's self-love what's self-acceptance is exposing the uncomfortableness to yourself about being different about the 
separating from your family when they said you can't leave because mm -hmm. if you leave, you're a traitor. Right. Or you've abandoned us. Mm -hmm. That, once that's exposed to them like you've done, you'll find a lot of relief. And that shame doesn't have power. Shame can never function yes. once it's been exposed. Oh, good. Once and, you open the closet and door, it's, it's been dark for a thousand years, and the light's in there, it's as if the light's always been on. Wow. And I guess shame and guilt, they go hand in hand together. Yeah, they don't help each other. <laughs> no. They don't help each no, other. No, no, they feed and off I each would, other. I would, I, I would just like to make a point how I realized that I had this shame in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, each time I was going to a grocery store, and because I live in the same neighborhood as my siblings and my parents, uh, so uh, each time, for so many years, so many mm -hmm. years, I, I, I still have that little feeling when I go to the grocery mm. store uh, that, oh, someone uh, from my culture will see me. So I always try to kind of walk in a different aisle when, they, uh, mm. when I see someone from my culture because I was like felt and bombarded that, you know, what I did was a shame to the family. And also, I guess, you know, like they made me feel uh, that shame so hard that like I still have that little voice and feeling when I still go to the grocery store. But then I keep reminding myself that, you know, why should I feel bad about it? Mm -hmm. You know, if they have an issue about what I did, uh, you know, it's their issue, not my right, issue. Right. I did nothing wrong. And that's, so, and that's you know, addressing it head on. And that is, is really, you know, very um, commendable of you. To do that, because yes. that's your your health, emotional, mental, physical. Well, Sonia, thank you. For but it took yes. a lot of time, a lot of yes. time, unfortunately. It does. You know, and, you know, like, you know, it took me, like, my entire, uh, like, you know, my, almost my entire life. Well, well that, it's yeah, ongoing. Yeah, I would suggest, yeah, that it is, you know, I think everything is ongoing, and we're always like evolving. evolving, and we're always working mm -hmm. on things within us, and internal and external. So I'm going to recommend that you pick up this book. Uh, it's Dr. Stephen Poulter, The Shame Factor. It, we're, yeah. um, and keep listening, ubngo.com right now, because we're going through a lot of the chapters, and um I would recommend, I think this will keep you in the ongoing and um, get on this health path that you're on right now and in, in making yourself better. And I want to thank you for calling in today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Bye thank now. You. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Well, that was good timing. Very good. <laughs> a, she said a lot of good things. One thing she said was, these people made me feel bad. No one makes you feel yeah, bad. Except yourself. Right. But that's shame. Shame has it believed that it's that they control you, right. their opinion controls right. you. Right, and that just comes from how shame reared its head in your childhood. Right, and the belief and that goes with yes, it. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it stays with you. Right. And then, because we were talking about, before Sonia called, we were talking about the not good enough, mm -hmm. or not feeling that you're not good enough. That kind of stuff really comes from your childhood, and most likely, and I remember this the last time we've talked about the book, mm -hmm. um, parenting. I mean, it's so important as parents that we are aware that we don't instill these different types of ways that shame can Girl. creep into our children's life by the way we handle them, situations, mm -hmm. uh, the way we talk to them, the way we talk to our, their, their, right. our other parent, our parents, whatever, you know, they're paying attention to everything. And it's also, Debbie, it sounds odd, but how we talk to ourselves. Right. Kids know how we feel about ourselves. Right. But, but we're, all, we're, are, we, are we, like, I remember as a kid, I really didn't think internally. Uh, everything was so fleeting. All my thoughts were so fleeting, those thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of thoughts a day. I never could put... Like, all I did was absorb what was being said to me, that if I wasn't mm -hmm. enough about something. My right. father used to get very angry at me because he would tutor me in math when I was in junior mm -hmm. high, when math started to get very difficult for me. I'm not a math end of it. And, sure. um, and he was. He was a mathematical ge genius. So he expected that of me. So right away, I wasn't enough. Right. And that 
I mean, to the point where he was red in the face and ready to punch, you know, and yeah. he wouldn't punch me, but I could see him. And uh, that never left me, but I mm -hmm. never put a thought to it, but it played out later but, in my adult life. But you did, you absorbed it. Yes, I, that's what I'm saying. That's what right. kids do, it's they like, absorb. But we can't, at the time, I guess is what I'm asking, as a child, we're absorbing, but we can't really curtail it. We can't really... That's how Aunt learn to deal that early, can we? Well, so it's more the parents that exactly. But let, let let's go forward, okay? okay? Because as adults with small children, the more we deal with our internal dis ease, mm -hmm. our kids benefit. Our kids, benefit. we know that because we fix right. it. We're working we're, on we're ourselves. healing ourselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. because the the continuum of parenting goes from your child feels very competent to all the way over here feels very. Um, defective mm -hmm. and how we talk to our kids sets the tempo for that absolutely and that is something you know dr spock in his famous book with parenting that's what he talks about mm -hmm. and dr dorothy briggs and your child's self-esteem that is the premise of her book which sold like i think 100 million copies right your child's self-esteem and she talks about shame in the late 50s early 60s when everybody's like what are you talking what? What's yeah, that? Taboo. Nobody talks Ta about like, shame back yeah, then. I mean, yeah, Certain antibiotics were expected. Even, you just yep, do what you you're just told. Did it. You don't have a lot of freedom of speech within the family exactly. or out of it, yeah. you know? But we were getting back to uh, the common functions. And then I want to spend a good amount of time because we're going to talk about intimate relationships and yes. shame and how they play out in, you know, because mm -hmm. those things are very important in our lives. Um, starting from the moment we have our first relationship and we don't want to keep making those same mistakes over and over again. So if we identify where we play, you know, who right. we are in that, in that shame factor. Generally one of the seven plays out and we were talking about embarrassment, mm -hmm. uh, it could be seen or um, the second one is the uh, anger. Always, like people talk about, yeah. you know, anger management, it really is shame management. The imposter syndrome is uh, plays out in the workplace more mm -hmm. where you feel like a fraud professionally right, 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 right. co-workers are going to see you there's a glass ceiling and there's always this impending doom when someone's upset with you at work right right and sunday's the worst day of the week for you right because oh my god i gotta go back to work and they're gonna find out right this whole this panic yep. of what this week is going to be like and, right. and they um, my, my veil will be on you know exactly. off again and the fourth element I talk about is the fear of isolation. Mm -hmm. And what that is, isolation, is you can't tolerate the feelings of feeling inadequate. And the idea of rejection, the myth of rejection, because I know when I was writing the book, the publisher didn't understand what I meant. I said, there's no such thing as rejection. We have to buy into it. We have to buy into it when someone doesn't like us. You know, I see it. All the in time. every stage of mm -hmm. life, rejection, rejection, rejection. I have friends, right? I have a lot of friends, you know, we're here in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends in the movie industry, and they're either actors, editors, directors, mm -hmm. cinematographers, and they go out, they're perfectly qualified for mm -hmm. the job that they're, you know, uh, applying for, or the job interview that they're going on, and they don't get it over and over and over again to a point where they take it very personally and it puts them into a very dark place. And I know everybody, depending on what their background is, mm -hmm. it's gonna play out differently. But how do, how does, how is somebody, I know it's not you, but how do, how do you overcome rejection and pick yourself up, stand up straight, dust yourself off and really not be the imposter and go forward? The word comes to mind is you, when we lose our perspective, there's the thing about being caught in um, grid traffic, you mm -hmm. know, stop and go try, versus being at 10,000 feet and looking down at the traffic. Mm -hmm. Two different experiences, same traffic. Right. Same traffic jam, the gridlock. And many times when people find that they don't get the job they wanted or they don't get the, the promotion they wanted, they get stuck in the gridlock, the emotional gridlock, where you go to 10,000 feet. Enough. Yeah, you go to 10,000 feet, it's a lot bigger than just one street. There's more, mm -hmm. it's a bigger picture. Perspective is how you help deal with that. Okay, and and yes. A wider perspective. Right, it's it's easier to say than do, let's Correct. be, and you know, and I know that's where people in well, your profession come in really handy because it is, it, it it's so big, it's mm -hmm. so in your face, rejection. Well, you know, and disappointment. 
people always say rejection. I always go to disappointment. Disappointment mm-hmm. is, more dis- is more debilitating because mm-hmm. the expectation is I'm good enough. Right. And then it doesn't you're happen. told you're not. Right. Yeah. And then the disappointment right. s- can stay for a lifetime if it's not right. addressed. Right. And you do have to address it. Right. Um, and so that plays out also in feeling like you're not good enough and rejection in intimate relationships and our personal relationships with That's our significant a big one. others. Right. Let's talk about okay. that. Fear of intimacy. You know, feeling like damaged goods, not good enough, feeling defective, tend to be emotionally guarded, defensive, less than. These are all common feelings. Mm-hmm. And intimate, intimacy and shame don't mix, as I was saying. Mm-hmm. Shame is emotional cancer. And as a 14-year-old asked me the other Another day. a good phrase, may I say. <laughs> said, what, what does that mean? Is that shame will eat away at the fabric of the relationship with yourself and your significant other. Right. And how does it play out? There's different ways it plays out. Like you have different terms for different ways that shame comes into a relationship. Yeah, I talk about, like I was talking about, where it comes in, it comes in amnesia, denial, and avoidance. Mm-hmm. Amnesia, I don't remember what happened. And even though they're behaving this way mm-hmm. or denial that didn't happen and their intimacy since they do they're in denial about why they're doing it and what they're doing and thirdly avoidance never really revealing what they're really feeling mm-hmm. and yeah you have a uh, in your chapter in your book on relationships and intimacy funny mm-hmm. enough there you talk about a story and the, and the name you use is Debbie I know you weren't talking about me because it wasn't my story but you were talking about that she was engaged and her fiance mm-hmm. was really, she was just avoiding everything that she should have been dealing with because he was really treating her very awful. It wasn't somebody that she belonged with, but she was being very passive mm-hmm. and, and not avoiding the issues that were at hand. And as a result, he was trying to step all over her. And you were helping her see it in right. a different perspective, in a different way, so she could get over the avoidance that she pro- that she had shame built around, obviously. And the denial mm-hmm. and amnesia. Right. Now, people, they get avoidance, they get denial. But amnesia, that's a tricky one because is I have no memory of how bad it is. Right. Or why I allow it to be so bad. Right. There's like no save button. Right. It's like you're, you're working on your laptop, you turn it off, it's all gone. And so is it just because it's familiar that you let it keep happening? Right, because under there's a reason why, because underneath that is something. And that vignette and the, and the story about Debbie, it's a fact is she didn't think she was good enough and that she could ever ever get married. So she just let whoever wanted to right, marry she her. She thought he was the best option she yeah. had. And it got so extreme, she couldn't do it. She could not rationalize it. Right. When he came up with a prenup, yes. she was the one making the money, and he came up with the prenup that was so irrational. It was like, really? You have to be hit over the head to be told you need to walk right. away from this? It, he did her a favor. Now, yeah. I have a lot of clients that deal with prenups, and many times it is a breaking point, not because of the issue of money or real property. It's the issue of the relationship so skewed, and then now you're putting it in writing. Mm-hmm. I find that. Now, there are other prenups which are just not a problem. But I have found many times it's part of the whole dysfunction um, and the shame of intimacy. Interesting. So how does one work on, when you identify that shame from that has been brewing all these mm-hmm. years is playing out in your personal relationship, in intimacy, in sex, how do we... What do we do to work on that, overcome yeah. it? Because we want that deep connection. Let, that let's you're remember not the triangle: be able to have. amnesia, yeah. denial, and avoidance. Okay, that so those triangle have to be right. The opposite of amnesia is being present. Okay. The opposite of denial is acceptance, and the opposite end of avoidance is approach behavior. When you're present, emotionally present, starting to feel the discomfort. And you're accepting this is what it is, not what I hope he he or she'll be. And you approach the issue. Shame can't. Rear its ugly head. Again, the closet door's open. Right. Light's coming in. Okay. Yeah. Those three elements, because amnesia, denial, and avoidance are the big three. That keeps it in place. Okay. It's like in um, 
with cancer, you need certain elements where the immune system's compromised, the white blood cell is compromised, and there's the rebellion. Shame is rebellion against you. All right. Shame rebels against your emotional health and well-being. It doesn't want you to be happy. Correct. And, and, and that's where we have to start doing the work on ourselves. Right. And I don't want to make this sound like, oh, my God, I, this is unbelievable. You know, terrible. Yeah, like it's, oh there's no hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> We're all going to yeah, live yeah, with yeah, this yeah. within this triangle yeah, no. <laughs> in some uh, some degree. You know, the idea yeah. is to reduce amnesia yeah. by being more present. Okay. Staying present. And like the book, The Power of Now. I mean, Eckhart Tolle, that's brilliant because if you're present, good stuff happens. Right. Because you can't be in denial. Right. And you're approaching issues. You're not, you're not avoiding them. Right. You're not driving 100 miles around the block to avoid this prenup that pretty much leaves you in a terrible position right. in a relationship. And it will make things so much worse. The other piece of intimacy and shame is that shame will always create issues outside of the person. Like they'll be blaming, there's a lack of commitment, there's financial problems, but it's always about something else other than them. Right. It keeps the attention off them. So, um, so another way it rears its its head. So you, uh, so that's basically um, uh, putting blame somewhere else other than looking again, getting back to well, dealing right. it, it, with the issues amnesia, that you have to deal with. Yeah, amnesia, denial, and avoidance. If that means I tar and feather my partner, so be it, or blame her. Yeah. No. So I was or, in a marriage like that. Mm -hmm. So as you know, which is what you've helped me through. Stay in the lane. Um, Stay in the lane. <laughs> we said being, that. Be on your side of the real estate. Yeah, this is your real estate. This mm -hmm. is the other real estate. You go over there, you're going right back, and you're going to let that. That's going to, uh, that, that's definitely going to tarnish you. It's right. going to make you sick, you know, right. by staying in that lane. But it's so easy to do, you know, when somebody um, moves and, and, and goes outside of themselves to blame you. Mm -hmm. for everything that's going wrong in their life or your life together. Do you know I always say so. to people, I wish that was true. Because if you're at fault for everything, then you can fix everything. Right. And we know that's not possible. Right. So therein lies the problem. Right. If so, that's that's good when you're couple counseling. I'm oh, sure. all the time. Because people always go, it's his fault. Sure, it's I, her fault. You know, you I always know? say, I wish that was true. Yeah. Because if it was. It'd be easy. Easy right, fix. They could fix it. Yeah. And now, you know, the relationships are playing tennis. You're on your side of the court. He's on his side. Right. Boom. Back Shame and forth. has you hit all the balls over the net, and you need to go over and hit him back. Right. Because if not, you're a bad partner. So we bas basically, in our relationships, we need to be balanced, and our shame equally needs to be dealt with wherever Correct. that comes out. Comes out. Yep. Yeah. And so, do you think most people, in order to do that, well, I would say, get your book. But do you think most people need? Um, outside help to be able to deal with how it's manifesting to have that really deep honest connection with somebody so shame doesn't I mean in most of my short-term post-marriage mm -hmm. relationships shame has played out in one of these you know ways where it hides itself mm -hmm. it's it's you know whether it was a money thing a lack of commitment thing right. but uh, which has kept me from making that connection to a deep connection right. with somebody long term, because there's shame in there. Right. And 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 I'm not exempt, you know. Yeah, nor am I. It, Debbie, to answer your question, is it good to go to the doctor once a year medically? Yes. Yeah. A tune-up. <laughs> exactly. As is see a good psychologist, a therapist. Absolutely. Yeah. And the reason why people are scared of it because they don't want to be they don't want to deal with the terrorists inside. That's right. Or, yeah, we don't want to deal. We don't want to admit. We and don't we want it. to avoid it. It's like doing taxes, you yeah. know? Let's just walk around, you, like you said, and we'll go around the go long around the way. Yeah. yeah. And guess what? It just gets worse. It does. You know? Shame, you know, it's emotional cancer. If you don't deal with cancer, it will ultimately consume your body. That's right. And unfortunately, so kill you. so So people who don't realize they're living with shame, Lastly, how do we? I know we're talking about it over and over no, in no, different no, ways, you know, but we need to identify that where we sit in these different. I think Debbie, part of it is deep down, people know something's not working, mm -hmm. and your comfort level is here, 
when your suffering exceeds this, things change. Mm -hmm. People do a lot to keep the comfort. That's how people get there. Okay. Lovely. I like that. That's how people We're get down. There. We are actually down to our last few minutes. So what I want to talk about mm -hmm. is where people can actually see you in person um, because you're going to be doing some book signings, right, that right. you have coming up? Yeah, I don't have anything booked yet because it's the summer, but I will post on um, stephenpolter.com. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. P-H-A-N. And they can find it, or on the shame factor, they can just type in my name, and it'll take them to my website also. Oh, good. Okay. And I'll have stuff there about what you know, doing stuff in the fall. I want to do some workshops. Oh, and, you are. Yes. Okay. Uh, how 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 are those going to manifest? That you're going to do group workshops? Yeah. No, I'm in do, person or online. Oh, in person. Okay. Yeah. Yay. I think this is not. I mean, eventually I want to online. It's fine, but in in the beginning right now, I want to do this in person. Okay. Because we're talking about open heart surgery. Workshops with people. Kind yep. of, uh, uh, that's good. I mean, yeah. sign up for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then all your books that, that we mentioned at the top of the show, we can also, uh, people can access through Amazon Correct. or your website, drstephenpolter.com. And, and I'll direct them to, to uh, online bookstores. Great. And I appreciate that so much. Love that. Yes. Now, shame is emotional cancer, and cancer can be healed. So seek out help. Right. Shame is not terminal. It is if we avoid it. Right. And I've dealt with it. No one's exempt. In the East, they call it delusion or Maya, this, you know, this stuff we all deal with. Or in uh, Western, we call it sin, where we feel like we're defective, we're separated from ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's all there. It's all within arm's reach. It's so funny. Um, I mean, it's not funny what you just said, but it's so funny because when you start dissecting how shame plays out in your life, has this, as your book does, and that's why I can't recommend this book enough. It's called The Shame Factor by Dr. Stephen Poulter. It will really, you'll identify yourself, you'll identify others, and it will really help you through life because shame can really take us down so if you want to come back up take a look at this book or if you know somebody who can use the help and I want to thank you for your sixth appearance <laughs> on my show every time you know you write a book or we come up with a topic at uh, uh, interest you are coming back because you, you are my it's my pleasure in-house guy my, so I thank you a, so much you're the best and I wish you all the best in your show and what you're doing. You're doing oh, a great thank job. you. Thank you. We're having fun. And I want to remind you that I'm a show that's the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. I do two shows a month, not every Tuesday now at two o'clock. We're a 50 minute format, the second and fourth Tuesday. I'm doing since January. And uh, you can also go to my Facebook page. Fit by Design, Balance Life by Debbie, and my shows live on there too. So they're all great shows that can help you become so much more in touch with what's going on in your life and when it comes to health and wellness. So I'm going to leave you today and say thank you for joining us and remember to keep connecting to a healthier you. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you, Debbie. You. All right. <laughs>